All right. I guess we will get started. Uh, please comment if there's any issues, um, and I will try to resolve them. Um, awesome. Well, I'm excited to be here uh, at Apache Con. This is actually my first one, um, and so I'm excited to, to be here. And I've only participated in a Apache project for about a year now. I think it's been a year and three months. Um, I was fortunate to join a company that's that's supporting a commercial, uh, uh, sorry, an Apache project. And so I've been exposed to the Apache project um, and the Apache Software Foundation and all the processes and, and the culture. And it's been, it's been a lot of fun. So I'm uh, hoping to share a little bit of what I've learned um, helping manage a Apache community and uh, talk about some lessons learned, hopefully some mistakes that folks can can avoid making like like we have. Um, and, and yeah, just hopefully just kind of be useful in general for anyone running a community um, or uh, working in developer relations. So I'll start off with the quick intro. So I'm Srini Karamati. I'm based in Cambridge, Massachusetts in the United States. Um, and I've been working remotely now for about five years. Uh, so it's kind of interesting with COVID and, and all of that. Um, Cause I think the rest of the world kind of, I guess, came to, to the experience of, of working remotely that, that I've had. Uh, so I'm a, a committer to the Superset project. Um, I work at Preset, which was started by Maxime Bouchemin, who also uh, was the original creator of Apache Superset when he was at Airbnb. And at Preset, we offer a commercial version of Superset. So we're I, my, a lot of my focus is on the open source community. Um, and I have uh, as well earlier today, Robert Stalls gave a, gave a great talk on some of the technical challenges of of trying to communicate and, uh, oh, sorry, trying to quantify and analyze and visualize uh, community data. Uh, so if you missed this talk, I, I definitely recommend checking it out. I'll focus a little bit more on the dashboarding side, lessons learned there, as well as kind of, you know, how do you choose the right metrics? Um, and how do you really get action out of the data? Um, for joining Preset, uh, I have, you know, I have a background in data science, so studied math in college. Uh, I spent five years helping grow DataQuest, which is an online learning platform for data science. So my all of my interest is around how do you help uh, people, how do you help more people get value out of data, use it effectively, um, and just lower the barrier uh, for, for to work with data. So I switched from helping people learn existing tools to hopefully helping make better data tools so that uh, they're just kind of more accessible in general. So one of the fun things about this talk and uh, the kind of ammo I was given when I joined a preset was basically uh, it's kind of superset inception type of thing where um, Max kind of tasks us with, hey, let's use superset to understand the superset community. So it's kind of an interesting uh, kind of dog fooding that we get to do. Um, and so Apache superset, we're a modern open source BI platform. We work with nearly any SQL speaking data engine. Uh, and that's because of uh, kind of making an early bet on SQL alchemy. So Superset's primarily written in Python and JavaScript uh, for context, and we support a large diversity of chart types, which makes dashboarding really fun. Um, so yeah, I mean, Superset was really created. Uh, you know, Max created Airflow and Superset around the same time uh, when he was at Airbnb. Uh, both have gone through the Apache incubator and, and graduated, and et cetera. Um, and he originally created it uh, while working in data engineering at Airbnb and kind of saw the limitations of Tableau at the time and they wanted to work, but they, they saw that the rest of the, the data stack was open source and moving quickly. Uh, There's Apache Druid uh, and Presto. So a ton of, you know, the Apache, Apache products are everywhere, right, in, in the data stack. And um, they saw a lot of limitations on his team and decided to think, why not, like, why not start a open source version of, of these proprietary BI platforms um, and and try to see if we can if the community can offer something compelling. I think um, what we learned is uh, mostly, yes, I think it is very possible to build this type of dashboarding uh, op in an open source way. So a little bit of the context for the community so you know where I'm coming from and the experience that I've had. So we have our community kind of lives in many places. Uh, which is one of the motivations for trying to build dashboards and to understand how distributed the community is. Um, in terms of the channels that we really spend a lot of time in and are able to drive impact and we kind of, you can say own or help drive those channels um, compared to like some other companies or 
and other open source projects forums where we're more of a participant. Uh, Slack and GitHub kind of reign supreme for us. So we have, uh, we're approaching 5,000 members in our superset Slack community. And this was, you know, the this, this Slack was great because it was just kind of a grassroots effort. Someone stood up a Slack instance and uh, just since then it's just kind of grown to this many people. And these, you know, approximately 40, 4,800 people are really a small slice of, of superset users. Um, superset has over 40,000 stars uh, and even more people using superset that you know, didn't start it. So it's just a massive, massive community. I think we're like still in top 170 for in terms of stars on GitHub. Uh, so it just kind of shows you the scale of, of superset, how many people are using it. It creates some interesting challenges for a community. When I came in to the superset community, it was, uh, it was kind of still 90% of, of this scale. And so coming into an existing community that didn't have much of a strategy or a lot of maybe deliberate a community strategy or love around it. Um, in some ways, it's great to join a community that already has people. In other ways, um, there's also a lot of you know biases and and pre-built assumptions and patterns that are can be also hard to overcome sometimes. Um, and last thing, kind of fairly uh, geographically distributed. So we got people um, in kind of U.S. and uh, which is where I'm based in North America more generally. A lot of people in Europe. A lot of people in Asia. Uh, a few folks in in kind of south and, and north parts of Africa as well. So you know, as with most things on the internet, it's kind of pretty geographically distributed. So um, this kind of hopefully helps sets the stage. Like, how do we really um, serve the community? How do we understand uh, what everyone needs? It's it's so large. It's um, quite spread out. Even when we think about planning events, like how do we do them so they're not too kind of focused on maybe California friendly times, which is where a lot of the uh, core committers and PMC members are based for Superset. Um, so all interesting challenges. Um, so I'll start by kind of talking some about the uh, technical uh, architecture. So this is, so again, as I mentioned earlier, Rob went into much more depth into the community tracker, as he calls it, the actual architecture for it. Uh, the fun thing is we're pretty much using all open source tooling here. So another kind of a win for open source data tooling. So we're using Airbyte. Uh, right now, we've we've tried a few different tools. Uh, they all have pros and cons. Uh, Airbyte was great for us just because it has a GUI and it's just kind of easy to use. It's great for people who maybe don't want to spend as much time uh, building data pipelines and sucking data out of different channels and, and so forth. Uh, so we're using Airbyte for now. Uh, we pull in data from uh, Slack, Google Analytics, and uh, GitHub, Slack and GitHub are the two ones that we're primarily interested in from a community management standpoint. The data goes into a staging environment. Um, all of this is in Postgres RDS, um, Postgres, another open source database, right? We use DBT, uh, which is also a really cool tool for managing and version controlling your queries and views. Um, and so this it lets you take raw data that's coming in from APIs that uh, may you know, needs to be cleaned and organized uh, joined and enriched, uh, and then lets us publish this final uh, community data schema that's actually more useful and can be queried in superset. So the structure of that data is much more human friendly instead of kind of what's convenient for the API. Uh, so this kind of came, this this reference architecture came out of many months of experimenting, mostly by Rob, as I mentioned. Um, I'm kind of more the data geek. I'm excited to play with the data. Um, I'm a little bit less experienced with moving data around uh, but more excited about getting value out of it. So I thought I would start with kind of a too long, didn't pay attention summary. So uh, there's, I wanted to kind of give maybe some of the lessons up front. What, what does it really take to build um, kind of a analytics and quantitative approach uh, to understanding your community and what are the challenges? And if you're kind of in the early stages, like what I would recommend rethinking or, uh, factoring in when you're thinking and planning about this. So first of all, I would say we vastly, vastly underestimated the amount of effort it takes to reliably perform data engineering with community data. So this is definitely something I would highly recommend outsourcing. There's a lot of great data syncing tools out there. Um, you know, they're usually not open source, but I think it, it is a way to get a lot of value very quickly where you just log in um, and you just say, yes, I want Slack data. 
every hour or every day, you, you share a OAuth API token and you're kind of done. Like there, there is something really valuable out of that uh, if you don't want to if you don't want to have one or two full time data engineers, which um, I imagine people who are trying to run communities are, are usually less interested in in doing all of that uh, work yourself. Uh, for us, it was fun to do and a good learning experience, and we got to document it and write blog posts. So it was kind of okay for us to justify the investment, but highly would recommend uh, just maybe paying for the data syncing um, from Slack, GitHub, Reddit, Discourse, wherever your community lives. Uh, if you want to build dashboards, you're going to need to pull data out of those places, store them in your own data warehouse or a data warehouse managed by someone else um, and connect it to some type of viz tool, some type of dashboarding tool if you're going to get value out of it. So that's the, probably the biggest lesson uh, we we had. Two, uh, reading in community data is much easier than writing community data. What I mean by that is there's this whole new kind of proliferation of community relationship management tools um, where you can uh, just you can share the community tokens and where and just specify here's where all of my community lives. And they have this kind of CRM esque interface where you can see who the you know top uh, people posting messages are, and you can kind of and what I mean by writing data is you can interact with them through the tool. So if you respond to the top contributors on your behalf, this tool will go and message them in Slack uh, as if it were you, right? So that's kind of what I mean by writing data. Um, initially, we thought we were like, oh, how much harder could writing be versus reading? Uh, reading in data is much, much easier, even though it is hard, as I mentioned in point one. Reading in data is way easier because it's um, you can kind of choose the pace you want to go if you want to sync every minute, every hour, every day. And um, you can kind of not care as much about old data being deleted or people you know, putting adding emojis to old messages or removing it. Um, it's just a much simpler problem. And you can kind of treat the data as, as somewhat just kind of this fixed pipeline that's coming in. Writing it out again is uh, a lot more work. Um, and I, I generally don't think it's worth it. I think it often will remove the human element as well. Like you want to build data assets and dashboards and use those insights to then go drive human activity, right? Like you want to, if you find five people who are very engaged in the community or filing a lot of bugs, you want to kind of thank them individually and personally instead of through some type of uh, mediated service possibly. Um, three, you know, defining useful community metrics is really hard and it's really fuzzy. There's kind of the shallow metrics like people logging in and, um, and uh, people posting new issues on GitHub, if that's what you're looking at. But it's very um, hard to know how to tie that to something that's a little bit higher level, like community love or the attraction that people have towards the community and the project. So this is kind of universally, people have talked about this a lot. Um, I know there's many uh, community-focused conferences that talk about measuring community, and I will say it's still very difficult. I think... Um, Ultimately, I'll talk in the next slide about what I do think works well. The last one I want to mention on this slide is um, if you had to dis if you had to kind of rank the order of problems in terms of difficulty and value, the hardest one by far, actually, which I haven't talked much about yet, is building a culture. So whether that's you're a company that's supporting a Apache or open source project, or uh, just kind of the people in you know the PMCs, the committers in an Apache project. Uh, building a culture that actually invests and prioritizes in building a nurturing community is really, really hard. Um, it's because, again, community is a little bit of a metric black hole. You know, you can't. It, it is difficult to to get get people to invest in this because it's sometimes you know people who are very analytical may want some ROI, and community is a tough thing to put into an ROI type of a framework. And um, it just and it's just a very manual process. You're kind of individually responding to each person and, at, and hoping to add value. And it's just uh, very time consuming. It's kind of like doing unpaid support is kind of what some people say it is. Uh, but if you're able to do it, and I definitely know of some open source projects that have done this well, um, I think uh, like the DBT and Airbyte communities are, if you want to go learn from communities that have done this super well, or GitLab, same thing, just go hang out in their communities and just see, uh, ask a question or, or uh, just you know participate in a poll or an event and see how quickly you get recognized and um, you feel valued in that community. I think that's really hard to pull off, but they've, those communities have done a great job. Um, 
even though this is the hardest problem, the second hardest problem I would say is building useful dashboards and data assets to support the first goal. Uh, this is hard mostly because of number three, but also because it is difficult to define good metrics. And also because uh, the dirty secret of BI and dashboarding is a lot of dashboards never get used. They never get a lot of love. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about how to counteract that in the next slide. And three, as I mentioned earlier, the data pipelines and infrastructure, all that kind of mess and technical complexity uh, to do one and two is, is actually in some ways the easiest problem. Uh, but it's also kind of the least valuable, right? Like just having the data does not automatically make you make your community better. It doesn't make your team of community managers or developer relations people more effective. Um, and so it is kind of the most, uh, in some ways, kind of hard to do, but also like kind of more of a prereq. So uh, the second page of kind of conclusions and, and lessons we've learned uh, six months trying to build a community tracker and community dashboards is, yeah, creating dashboards really isn't enough. Um, there's a great blog post uh, by a few friends of mine uh, called a Treat Your Data Team Like a Product Team. And I think that resonates uh, a lot here. So if you're going to spend a lot of time getting in data, you know, structuring it, cleaning it up, making charts, and building dashboards, uh, you have to treat it like a product. But you have to treat it like this is going to take a few weeks probably. Are people actually going to use it? Um, so doing a lightweight kind of design and product development lifecycle type of process is actually uh, can be really useful. So you can do wireframing, you can build something simple that has a lot of limitations, solicit feedback, uh, build something, and then uh, iterate, right? Like, so just, just like any other product, um, that's it's not something people talk about enough, I think, with building data assets. But I think uh, because of all the problems I mentioned earlier and how much time it takes, uh, you should treat it like a product and make sure that you're iteratively getting value out of it. Um, last two quick kind of summary points and lessons learned, I would say, is if you're just starting out, um, yeah, I don't know how familiar people are with the Orbit model. Um, I think it was kind of published by Scott Woods, and, and now it's an entire company. But if you search Orbit model for community love, you'll find a GitHub markdown page with kind of how, it, you know, how it's explained. But it talks about how people graduate from uh, different orbit levels. So people start off very passive. They hear about a project. They're vaguely interested. Maybe they want to try it out uh, versus um, that's level four, right? They're kind of in the outer orbit. So this is most people. Most people have heard about your product or community or activity, whatever you're forming your community around. Um, they're vaguely interested. Uh, but the real kind of thing that's important is that they graduate from level four, three, two, one. Level one would be people who are evangelizing. They are telling their friends and family about the community and uh, pro open source project or whatever it is the community is based around. So they're kind of so convinced and so happy to be in this community that they're going around on their own time and actually evangelizing it. That's kind of the, the highest level, uh, I would say. So um, that's it, it, so all this to say as kind of an answer to my earlier challenge of how do you build good metrics, if you only had to pick one and you had very limited resources, I would only focus on this one. How many people are kind of loosely in each orbit level one to four? And how many have really, you know, in the beginning, you probably want to focus on numbers eventually as you scale percentages. But um, how many people are level one? How many people are, you know, kind of banging down your door? They want to contribute. They want to give talks and they want to participate even more in the community. Um, I think the more that you have there, the more that you know that you're onto something. Um, and lastly, you know, habits, routines, uh, as with most things in human life, um, the, the the what you do every day or every week trump kind of the occasional breakthroughs or pushes that you do. So that's kind of um, we we run we have weekly um, oh, sorry biweekly community announcements in Slack. We do monthly newsletters. Uh, we do every other month meetup. I'm hoping to kind of two to three x the frequency of of all of them. But uh, what yeah, what you do regularly, like we we see nice spikes and people come back and, and re-engage and spend time uh, helping each other out whenever we kind of inject um, some love into the community with these type of things. So habits and routines, much better than kind of occasional big launch announcements or um, or kind of big events. Uh, it's better to do repeated things. Um, so I kind of wanted to show you a little bit about, uh, show, show off our Slack dashboard. So uh, this is something uh, simple that we built. We still has a lot of limitations, but 
Um, this is kind of our, our first version. And we use this uh, to understand kind of um, the impact of certain types of changes and, and also better understand how channels have changed over time. So for example, end of last year, I believe, we, we renamed one of the channels. And so it was interesting to see um, kind of how people were posting differently based on the name of the channel, for example. But you know, this is a dashboard, just like any, any other thing that you've seen. You can come in here and uh, put in the, um, and these are all different Slack channels, right? So you can put in general, you have a general channel, uh, or at least we used to before we renamed it. We have this channel called Windows. We have a SQL lab, which is our SQL IDE. We have a random channel. So we can just kind of filter this data, hit apply, and then see um, where people are posting. So amongst these five channels, um, it's like only people are posting in general. The other channels are, are really not uh, much of a going going concern. You can also see how people are cross posting, or sorry, are, are living in multiple channels. So for example, here we have the number of people that are both in beginners and community feedback. That's because uh, when you join the Slack, you're added to both channels. So that kind of explains um, the spike there. So this type of dashboard we've used to understand high level engagement. So how many people are you know, creating threads every week um, and how many people are, are joining every month, right? And how is that compared to the month before? Where are people based out of? This is especially useful when we're trying to plan events and trying to understand of the people that joined the last month or two, uh, you know, where we need to make sure we're showing love to people that are not in our time zones uh, or where the kind of core PMC and committers, uh, the majority of them uh, happen to live, right? So that is kind of something we always think about. Uh, members per channel. So where are people, uh, which channels are people posting in and are, are joining? So as I mentioned earlier, everyone is added to general by default. There's an introductions channel, but not everyone does introductions. So that's been like a big, we've used this dashboard to help increase this number. It used to be much lower. Um, and when we started it, we actually pushed a bunch of people to say, hey, when whenever anyone joins, let's let's reach out to them. Let's say, hey, what you know, glad to have you here. We help manage the community. Uh, what are you hoping to get? Like, why are you excited about Apache Superset, et cetera, right? So we really try to take every interaction, uh, every single person who joined and uh, found our Slack link that's kind of like hidden on the Apache site, right? Like people who've jumped through all these hurdles, we really want to uh, make them feel valued. Um, and so this type of dashboard helps us kind of understand uh, how many people are, are posting. Uh, so we can like, for example, just look at introductions. Um, and we can see how many people are posting introductions um, week over week. Uh, and that's kind of always a fun thing to do. Um, I guess we've gone a little bit worse, so we need to we need to think about that again. But yeah, so this, there's a lot of kind of fun data stuff you can you can do and play with with this type of dashboard. And this is just Slack data, um, and so you can uh, you can kind of imagine when you add uh, more when you add more data sources, what, what you can really get out of it. So um, so yeah, I mean, next thing, you know, what if we started over, right? So as I mentioned, it was kind of a big five month um, process to do all this type of work. Um, I think, you know, in retrospect, we would have probably focused on just a single channel. And I don't mean Slack channel, I mean like medium. So like maybe just Slack, maybe just um, GitHub. Uh, and we would have just focused on less data. So let's not even get all the pull requests and all the commits. Like maybe we just get GitHub issues and we just build a very, very simple dashboard of the number of issues being created and what they're being tagged as a feature request as a bugs um, to help us understand uh, and even help kind of the committers and PMCs understand like, hey, what's like, are we introducing more bugs with more releases? Like, where's this going? Um, and what do we need to pump the brakes a little bit on new feature development sometime and actually maybe focus on, on fixing some of these bugs, right? And that's the type of thing that uh, with even just a manual export of data uh, to Google Sheets or, or something, like that's something we could have done in one week. Within one week, seen the data, gone the insights. And the whole goal here is not um, data entering for the sake of it. It is to get some value, get some insights, and drive improvements in how people engage with the community. And uh, that's something we constantly get feedback on from coworkers and other committers and PMC members is like, yeah, I want to help, but I don't know how to, or yeah, we have a lot of GitHub issues, but I don't know if we should close them more, what our policy should be, right? Just the sheer scale sometimes 
this is one of the curses I mentioned earlier of, of just having a relatively popular open source project is there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of kind of information, a lot of people wanting things uh, and understanding how you can build a community of love with kind of carve that out within that is, is very challenging uh, for sure. Two, I think we would do more of an iterative approach, as I mentioned earlier, and expose the limitations of data and dashboards and then use that as a motivation to then spend a few weeks um, getting data. And as I mentioned here, another nod to uh, companies like Fivetran or Stitch or Luma. There's there's tons of services. You don't have to use the ones I mentioned here, but um, they, there's many that have good connections to uh, the data feeds and the APIs uh, that's powering your community. So if you can avoid uh, pulling the data out yourself, I highly recommend it. Some of them even have seven and 30 day trials or row level trials. So you can sync like a thousand rows or something, right? So that could also be a way uh, to make sure that uh, you're getting value from the data. Um, three, I think one of the things we, we struggled with was like, what should the community metrics be, right? So I think uh, filling in those gaps uh, would would really be useful moving, uh, if we were to do it again, um, and that would better drive kind of our investments. Uh, so what's next? So oh, the next exciting thing, you know, to go back to here is we want to actually start cross-referencing data between GitHub and Slack. There are people in both communities. There are people in just Slack. There's people in just GitHub. Um, it would be great to start to identify who who are in both communities and what that life cycle is. Do people start by opening a GitHub issue and then they come to Slack and seek help, um, or they are trying to drum up interest in in some type of superset improvement proposal? Right. We just don't have any knowledge of that right now. Um, so being able to Cross-reference data on both uh, both the Slack and GitHub channels would be uh, a welcome upgrade, uh, and we're planning that in the next few weeks. So I'm hoping next year or whenever we do next Apache Con, we can showcase our progress. Uh, and we are working on open sourcing all of this. Uh, so if you are curious, uh, you can join the Superset Slack or reach out to me directly in the next month or so. We would like to um, release our DBT models and 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 our code so anyone can. Just change the repo name, just change the Slack token, and get the same dashboards that we've been uh, slowly working on. The next thing we'd love to do is pull in data from third-party websites. So uh, we have, as I mentioned earlier, Superset, the goal is to really work with any SQL database. So there are people in those database communities, whether it's Postgres or Druid. You know, There's so many databases, uh, Timescale DB, Rockset. They are, there are people there who are asking in their forums and in their social media and their communities, like, hey, I want to use this with Superset, but I'm having this issue or it's not documented or uh, et cetera, right? And um, that's, we're very blind to that, but I think we still consider them part of our community. It's someone that heard about Superset and wants to try it out or is maybe already using Superset with a different database and they want to move to another one. And so we still consider them part of our community, but we don't hear from them because they may not have joined our community. Some of them do, uh, but many of them don't. And um, so can we start to pull in data from places like Reddit where people are asking questions about superset and data engineering, et cetera? You can just do some keyword searches. It's all public data. Can we just pull that in? And then uh, when we see something interesting, go and actually respond or help them or even wel welcome them to our Slack and GitHub communities. Um, that would be kind of a nice next step for us um, as well. So uh, to kind of wrap things up, some references. Uh, I think one of the best ones I've read recently uh, is by Sean uh, Swix. I don't know how you say it, Wang. Um, he has a great post called Measuring DevRel. Uh, you can replace DevRel with community management uh, or customer uh, community building, et cetera. I think it's, it's kind of, the lessons are somewhat similar, but his post is really good. He talks about how to think about measurement in a community and DevRel context and kind of frame has nice three three big framings um and and really tries to help you understand like what are the metrics that matter and how do you understand them um uh, it's a good post it's um yeah it, it really helped shape my thinking uh it's only like three weeks old and i was able to use some of that some of the ideas in his post and um uh, for this for this talk as well second measuring the impact of your developer relations team um again replace developer relations with community management uh, and OpenView Partners, this, uh, I think they're based in Boston, just like just like me, and they have a great post on how to measure the impact um, while still kind of preserving what's what's great about community work. And lastly, the blog post I mentioned earlier, run your data team like a product team, uh, building data assets, data dashboards, charts, 
analyses. It, it takes a lot of work. So uh, make sure you get value out of it. Make sure your audience um, gets value out of it and gets insights out of it. Otherwise, um, you're going to be spending a lot of time and, and maybe not getting a lot of value out of it. Um, and and your stakeholders may not uh, help you with that first goal that I mentioned of, of fostering that culture of community. Um, so yeah, those are, those are my tips. Hopefully some of it was useful. Um, as I mentioned in the coming month or two, we would like to start open sourcing this work, uh, so that anyone can, uh, use it on their own. Um, and, uh, hopefully start to get some value and add, um, and understand their own community and see kind of what works well. So, um, that's pretty much it for my talk. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions that, that people have. Uh, and let's see. Thanks for sharing. Can you share the slides and present? Oh, never mind. Um, okay. Um, yeah, happy to stick around for a few more minutes if people have questions. Um, otherwise, I appreciate everyone coming and, and hope hopefully it was useful. Uh, if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to reach out to me. You can just Google my name and I, I'm sure you'll find my Twitter. Uh, pretty quickly uh, so I'm not seeing any questions um, great well it was great great talking um, yeah I hope everyone has a good rest of the rest of the day and, and a great Apache conference um, and thanks again for having me it was uh, it was a pleasure bye